Hello and welcome to Body and Spirit, a Buddhist approach to physical and mental health. My name is Anthony McGregor, I'm your host, and today we have with us Pra Pandit on my left. Pra Pandit is an ordained Theravadan Buddhist monk. He is also the chief organizer of the Little Bangkok Sangha, an uh, English-speaking Buddhist group here in Bangkok. Thank you for coming, Pra Pandit. And on my right, we have Dr. Holly Dugan. Dr. Holly is a retired clinical psychologist, and she is also a lecturer in psychology at Assumption University in Bangkok. So I'm going to start the questioning by asking uh, Prapandit a question about Buddhism and health. Uh, Prapandit, meditation, which is one of the greatest uh, teachings of the Buddhist in the past 10 years has become a mainstream medical tool for solving a whole host of medical problems ranging from menstruation cramps to headaches to anxiety and stress and depression. Do you see any problem with taking what was originally a, uh, a spiritual practice and turning it into a secular tool to solve medical problems. Sure, if it can be used and it's useful, then why not? Should be able to take it and use it if it's effective. Okay. I, I should say, however, that it's not really, meditation isn't usually used as a solution for these kinds of problems. Uh, it's better when it's used in tandem with conventional medicine and conventional approaches. Yes, yeah. Yes, um, I, and what about you, Dr. Holly? What do you think about that, that question? Um, well, I'm not sure whether it would be okay uh, from a Buddhist perspective, but from um, the perspective of a clinical psychologist or a therapist working, um, it, it, they're adjunct, the two kinds of meditation, one not particularly so much Buddhist, the concentration meditation, which you might introduce to someone who is anxious, or the mindful medit mindfulness meditation that you might introduce to someone who is depressed, it gets completely unhooked from Buddhism. Because when clients come to you, they're thinking of their pain, and they're not mm -hmm. needing you to say, well, the Buddha says, or this Buddhism teaches us. It's just how um, in concentration meditation you can get some relaxation and get away from your anxiety yes. or in mindfulness how you can work with your depression. Has it worked with your patients? Have you been pleased with the results of meditation in dealing with psychological problems? Yes, but it has not been very deep. In the beginning, uh, of course you read you can't teach anything that you haven't experienced yourself so I used my own experience um, and didn't try to go any farther at all but I certainly found that the concentration meditation one-pointed meditation mind uh, breathing and um, those calming techniques absolutely uh, were very, very useful. Okay. So you, you found it to be true when you tried it, is that correct? Absolutely. And, and you found that it calmed you and relaxed you? and It d will do anything you want. Uh -huh. It gives you yeah. some mental control and some time, yeah. a little bit of time. Yeah. And I used to, for myself, use just a little bit of breathing and gear shifting between patients. If I had I once had a private practice. I had four clients right in a row. They had 10 minutes in between, and during that 10 minutes, I would do a little breathing, try to clear my mind, and remember the client who was coming. They were quite similar. Mm -hmm. They say if you do psychotherapy, you can watch your own problems come mm -hmm. in the door. And these were four women. They were all my age, and they all four had very quite similar problems. But I, so it was um, sometimes hard to keep track of them, 
and I would do a little meditation in between. I see. And, yeah. and also encourage them to meditate? Or? And to the extent that uh, one of the women, this wasn't my problem that came in the door, but one of the women was very obsessive compulsive. And I, she did her own kind of relaxation tricks, but I was, she was also almost psychotic a lot. So I didn't um, teach her to really uh, do so much on her own because I was a little frightened. I see. Yeah, so. yeah. What what happens when you meditate, uh, Prabhupada? What when when you meditate personally? What what goes on? What uh, what happens to you? It depends. I mean, you see what what's going on in your own mind. So that can be anything. <clears throat> some days you like this, some days you like that. But real meditation, uh, you should be observing the whole time. So you observe everything that happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not the plan to try and get a particular experience. I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, but most people do report having a calming uh, experience when they meditate. Can is have a calming true? effect. Yeah. Um, but sometimes what you see is not so much a calming effect, but you see all what isn't calm inside your own mind. Okay. So you sometimes you sit and meditate but all you see is the anxiety or the busyness mm -hmm. or the you know the compulsiveness of the thinking. Sometimes that's the experience. Okay. Yeah. Do you think that meditation could be useful to everyone? It could be useful to everyone. It doesn't mean everybody would make use of it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's probably a bit like avocado or something, you know, anybody can make use of it, but not everybody would like it. I see. So meditation is very much for people who want to do it. I think anybody who wants to do it can make use of it if they want to, yes. I see. Does it take determination to make it useful? Sure, you have to be determined and you have to be consistent and you have to really apply it. Mm -hmm. um, but it depends whether we're talking about two separate things here. One is the goal of enlightenment and that's Buddhism. And that's why we're doing the meditation in Buddhism. Mm -hmm. But as you introduce the section here, you're talking about using it for medical benefits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a slight difference in these two um, goals. Yes. Now if you're taking something from Buddhism to use it for medicine, that's fine. But what you're ending up then with then is another kind of therapy or a therapeutic tool. Mm -hmm. So that's not really Buddhism, you've taken it out of its original context. Right. Now that might be useful, I mean, uh, psoriasis of the skin for example, they did these tests, if you practice mindfulness meditation while you're having the UV light, which is the main treatment for psoriasis of the skin, mm -hmm. then it heals four times faster uh, according to the result. Mm -hmm. So things like that, it's quite useful for. I think anybody then can do, uh, can pick it up and use it and gain some benefit from it. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Dr. Holly, uh, John Kabat-Zinn, uh, an American doctor and psychologist, is, uh, sorry, he's a psychologist and also a Buddhist, and he has had uh, tremendous success in using meditation and mindfulness in solving psychological problems. He's developed an eight-week intensive course uh, called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. And there was a study done on the results of that program, which found that the majority of people were helped, at least the, the, the people who had more than three episodes, sorry, more than two episodes of depression. After they took the program, the likelihood of that depression returning was uh, significantly reduced. And in the, um, uh, in the case of those who had uh, only two episodes of depression, there was no impact, strangely enough. But there have been other programs developed uh, in other countries. In Britain, for instance, Dr. Clive Sherlock developed the adaption practice. But in your view, have these programs captured the essence of Buddhism and the other things that we have in Buddhism, the 
the robes and the rituals and the ceremonies, the organizations and doctrines about karma and re rebirth. Do you think these are all secondary and that perhaps modern psychology might have captured the true gift of the Buddha? Um, to the extent uh, that the methods, meditation methods, encourage someone to look within and give someone the tools to look within without becoming too frightened. Mm -hmm. To that extent, um, that Buddhism has been a good key. Now whether that would have happened with uh, early work by a man named Dykeman on the observing ego and some socio psychosocial work about how Westerners tend to be externally focused and instead of internally focused. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, it might have happened automatically, but again, it gets quite removed from Buddhism per se. Mm -hmm. So the Buddhist part really is the mindfulness meditation mm -hmm. because the concentration, one-pointed meditation, guided meditations, etc., they can be, they're generic. So the mindfulness meditation, which is the particular one, based on the first noble truth, at first and second noble truth, that uh, there is suffering and that that suffering comes from you, mm -hmm. is actually a truism. truism. You wouldn't tell a patient where you're making yourself sick, except maybe I have on occasion. Mm -hmm. um, but it is true that the dilemma is how somebody looks at it. So in John Kabat-Zinn's programs, what depressives look at is thing, are, are, are things like um, they look at actually in cognitive behavioral psychology as well, things like negative self-statements, self-limiting ideations, um, things that uh, somehow in your own mind inhibit you from getting where you want to be. Mm -hmm. And people are not always aware of what they are mm -hmm. because it's depressing. And they, you know, they cocoon themselves or maybe step back from it. Mm -hmm. But to the extent that people can relax and start to look and see through that mindfulness meditation what comes up in your mind. Mm -hmm. What comes up in your mind may not be happy thoughts and it might not always be good memories. Things might stir you up. But in the context of therapy, that can be discussed. Mm -hmm. And what the um, th ther the patients in John uh, Kabat-Zinn's program found or actually worked on was a thought is just a thought. It comes and goes like a sound. So if you have an ugly thought, you it can come up for you. You can sort of feel it, but you want to be able to feel it, because otherwise then you can't push it off, you can't know when it's gone. If you just hide from it, it doesn't work as well. So you get the, the ugly stuff coming up, and then you figure out how, where it comes from, why is it always there for you, how can you just let it move along. Yes. So, uh, but it was quite limited, and um, to find those outcome measures and uh, yes. targets, uh, it's difficult to yeah. validate. Yes. Have, have, oh, sorry, Pam. 